Welcome to the Voices of War, a podcast with a simple vision to bring to life the true costs of war through the voices of those who've lived it. I'm Maz, and I speak to soldiers, academics, refugees, peacemakers, and anyone else who's been touched by war in the hope of demystifying and, most importantly, de glorifying it. If you like what you hear, please consider showing your support by reviewing the show wherever you get your pods. You can also support us on our Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee page. Links to both are in the show notes. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. My guest today is Major General Mick Ryan, who only days ago officially retired from more than 35 years of service in the Australian Army. During this time, he has deployed on multiple overseas deployments, has commanded troops at platoon, squadron, regiment, task force, and brigade levels, and among the many awards for service and excellence he has received, in 2008, Mick was also awarded the Order of Australia for Distinguished Leadership of the Australian First Reconstruction Task Force in Afghanistan. He's a recognized expert in leadership, institutional strategy, technology, organizational adaptation and change management, institutional reform, as well as personnel development. Mick is also a prolific writer and speaker with a particular focus on thinking about and preparing for the battle space of the future. This is also what his recently published book is all about. It is titled War Transformed, the Future of 21st Century Great Power Competition and Conflict, and is a deep dive into how four key disruptors, namely geopolitics, demographics, technology, and climate change, will impact great power rivalry. In short, Mick explores how the dynamics of the nascent fourth industrial revolution and its interplay with the ongoing changes in the way we live, as well as the dramatic shifts in global affairs, will transform tomorrow's wars. He joins me today to talk about his book, but I've actually asked General Ryan to bring our interview forward from our originally agreed upon date because what he writes about is almost eerily reflected in what we're seeing play out during the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. Hence, we agreed to speak today on the morning of the 6th of March in Australia, as the war in Ukraine nears the end of its 10th day. General Ryan, thank you very much for joining me on The Voices of War. Thanks, Ryan. It's great to be with you today. So just before we get into the ugliness of the ongoing invasion of Ukraine, maybe let's take a moment just to get to know you a little more. You spent three and a half decades serving in the army. What motivated you to join all those uh, years ago? Um, well, I was brought up in a little mining town in central Queensland. Um, but, you know, my, my folks and, and indeed the community there had always brought me um, and, and my friends up there with, I think, a pretty strong service, service ethic. Uh, certainly my parents had. And uh, I, after going through a phase where I wanted to be an archaeologist after seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I was yeah, going to say, haven't we all? <laughs> yeah, it still is a little attractive at times. Um, I kind of centred on becoming a civil engineer and then becoming a civil engineer in the army. And um, you know, I applied for a scholarship to ADFA when I was 15 to do that, got a scholarship and then uh, went to ADFA to do that. And if I'm uh, correct, I've, I'm pretty sure I've read and heard elsewhere that it wasn't all smooth sailing <laughs> uh, initially for a uh, uh, officer cadet. Uh, no, Ryan. <laughs> for, for a young 17-year-old from cent- a small town of 5,000 people in central mm. Queensland, it was a bit mm. of a shock. And to be fair, you know, I probably wasn't mature enough at that point of my life to appreciate the amazing opportunity the Army was giving me. Um, so, yeah, I, I failed every subject in uh 1987, seems like a long time ago now, but at other times seems like yesterday. Um, But I was hugely fortunate that uh, Army Major General PJ Day kind of took me aside in his office and said, listen, you really haven't had a very successful academic beginning, but I think you've got the makings of an Army leader, so why don't we send you over the hill to Duntroon and we'll see how you go. And uh, I find it uh, a wonderful irony that uh, your last, well, your last full-time job uh, in the army, although you remain in the army as, as a reservist, uh, was as the commander of the Australian Defence College, <laughs> which yeah, is, of I mean, course, there, our, yeah, sorry. There, there's some irony there that one of the uh, elements of the college is the Australian Defence Force Academy. It was actually um, 
really, really nice to be able to go back there, spend four years, um, you know, most Wednesdays, except for during exams or when the cadets weren't there, I would have lunch with a group of cadets in the cadets' mess and just talk to them about their thoughts, their aspirations, uh, their challenges. Uh, they're a different generation, uh, the generation that's coming through at the, at the moment, but they're better connected, they're fitter, they're smarter, and they're every bit as motivated as my generations and preceding generations were to serve their country. Mm. And I guess that's a neat uh, neat segue into the book as well. The title, again, is uh, War Transformed, the Future of 21st Century Great Power Competition and Conflict. And I guess one of the things that you open up the book as well is the you talk about the nature of war versus the character of war. And just that point you made about the cadets today that, yes, while they might be smarter, quicker, more connected, uh, they're as motivated uh, or as attached, uh, I guess, to Australia and nationhood uh, as your generation was. Um, can you talk about this dichotomy between you know, the nature of war versus the character of war. Um, and, and maybe that's a, then a neat segue to talk about what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine as well. Yeah, the nature really is about those things are inherent in all kinds of uh, human warfare. Um, the uncertainty, what we call the fog and friction. I mean, it's a cliche, but it's also a very real thing. We see it in every kind of human conflict because you cannot read the mind's of humans. Uh, you cannot always predict what they're going to do. Um, and one of the great continuities of war is surprise. We're always trying to surprise each other. Um, and the other element of the nature of war is it is humans who make all the decisions, or at least all the important ones, about warfare. Uh, no matter what developments we might see in some kinds of autonomous weapon systems. I mean, we've had them for a while in Navy closing weapon systems or even Patriot mm. air mm. defence missiles. The ultimate decisions to turn those things on, assign them sectors, allow them to actually operate are human, just as the political decisions and strategic decisions are, are taken by humans. So that's war's uh, unchanging nature. Uh, the changing character is how, where we fight, how we fight, uh, the tools with which we fight, um, all continue to evolve. Every single war is different just because of mm. geography, uh, demography, technology, uh, or just the aims over which wars are fought. And we're seeing that play out now in Ukraine. We're seeing lots of new things. Live streaming the war is largely new. Um, we've never had the type of insight into day-to-day -day conflict that we're seeing now play out mainly over Twitter but other forms of social media. Mm. But at the same time, we're seeing its inherent nature play. There's lots of things we still don't know. There's lots of times that both sides have been surprised, although I think the Russians have probably been surprised more at every level than the Ukrainians have. And there are some new technologies that we're seeing, principally um, the use of social media and the internet to generate strategic influence on behalf of the Ukrainians. So it is a great uh, case study of this um, enduring nature and changing character of warfare. Mm. And that's why I opened up with uh, and why I asked you to, to record this earlier, because as I was reading you, your book, uh, it became so obvious that, uh, you know, what I was reading was literally playing out, as you said, mainly on Twitter. Um, and this is uh, also a question maybe that we can dive into in a little bit more detail, and that's the information operations uh, that we're seeing because you do touch on it uh, as well in the book. So you've alluded to the Russians struggling uh, with that at the moment, but maybe uh, maybe you can go into a little bit more detail as to what you're seeing, particularly in this information operation space and the competition for influence, which you spend a little bit about uh, in, in, your in your second chapter of the book uh, to write about. So maybe you can just dive a little bit deeper into that, you know, what are we talking about when we say information operations in this case? Uh, and then who is winning? Yeah, there's there's a few dimensions to this, right? Mm. Uh, the first one is both sides want to project a positive image of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, clearly, the Ukrainians are winning big time in this. I mean, the Russian pronouncements, particularly those of the Russian president, um, you know, have mm. either been fantasies or plain delusional. Um, so that's part of the information battle. 
The second piece is allowing access by third parties to also get out information, whether they're journalists, um, non-government organisation and third-party observers. Once again, the Ukrainians are being enormously successful and the, the world press has had pretty good access generally to what's going on there. A third piece in information warfare is the conduct of operational security where you seek to preserve really important elements of friendly information that you don't want the enemy or anyone else to know that will uh, inform locations, future intentions and a whole range of military and strategic aspects of war. Mm. So that, that's a third piece. Mm. A fourth piece is obviously deceiving the enemy, the conduct of deception operations. I mean, deception has always been part of warfare. I mean, it's all about ensuring the enemy is weakest where you want them to be weak and strong where it's irrelevant. Um, so deception is also part of information operations. Mm. But you also need a strategy as a government and as a military high command to pull all those things together. You can't just assume they're going to happen. Um, as we might say in the military, it can't just be Annex X in the op board. It has to be an integral part of planning right from uh, day one. And as I say in the book, violence and influence are two sides to the same coin in warfare. Mm. So what do you put Putin's success or absence of so far because i mean it's a it, you you made the point that it's you know he's either delusional or, or living in a fantasy world um, but i think this is also and you also just talk about russia quite a lot uh, as 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 a as, as a case study in your book uh, as to how it's changing uh, its character of war not necessarily nature um, we've seen putin try i guess the same tactics that he's used before that were successful that worked for him um, so what's what's different now? What do you what, and and what do you put the current situation down to? Um, I think the Russians have largely bluffed the world about their military capability. Um, you know, there's there's no doubt that the Russians over generations have had some very fine military theorists. I mean, operational art mm. emerged out of Russian before. The Second World War, and it was appropriated during the Cold War for alien battle and, and, and a whole range of other activities. Um, some of the more recent developments led largely, but not exclusively, by General Gerasimov, um, and there are other military theorists who have been very important here besides him. But this notion of active defence mm. and some of their other uh, evolved military ideas have gained the attention of many in the West uh, but it is also fair to say that these new hypotheses about war fighting from the Russians uh, are yet to be proven in the mm. Ukraine. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's what that what we're seeing. And just bringing it back to the information operations, one of the aspects that struck me uh, as, as as surprising and something I've, I've touched on on the podcast with a number of people already uh, is that this perhaps is the first time we're seeing war not just waged by military people, uh, but it's war has gone on scale uh, to the Ukraine citizens more so than anywhere else. And as, as we talked about before, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a child of, of Sarajevo and Sarajevo resisted what is, you know, still the longest siege uh, of any city uh, and the people resisted it. But there was still an element of the population that was that was passive. Uh, it was uh, hiding in the cellars, struggling to survive, doing their bits and pieces, looking after each other. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, the army or the territorial defence that fought. We're seeing something very different now. And, and again, to use Twitter, we're seeing, you know, te techniques and procedures being passed down through Twitter on how to fight an urban war, how to use Molotov cocktails, what to target on a, mm -hmm. an armoured vehicle or on a personnel carrier. Uh, that is very different. And I guess that's also part of this information operations uh, that's certainly, from my view, sided with uh, Ukraine uh, and those who are resisting it. You'd mentioned surprise uh, as one of the enduring features of war. Do you think this was a big surprise to Putin? Uh, and how is he handling it now with his commanders, no noting the rather top-down leadership style uh, that Russian forces employ? Yeah, I think he has been surprised. Uh, you know, uh, his narrative up to now was that 
uh, he assumed that Ukraine was a natural part of Russian uh, imperium. Um, and that's how he's talked. That's how he continues to talk, mm. to be frank. Um, the massing of nearly 200,000 Russian military around the periphery of Ukraine was designed to scare, to overawe, and to coerce Ukrainians into political concessions. That did not happen. Um, so when Russian troops uh, began their invasion rolling across the border, um, I think he was surprised he had to do that. But more mm. importantly, he was surprised at the huge amount of resistance that those troops um have continued to suffer, but particularly in the first 48 hours, you know, they really tried to attempt a fast, cheap and easy invasion of Ukraine with light forces, special mm, forces mm. and paratroopers, which frankly uh, wasn't terribly clever. Those forces uh, are hard to sustain at distance and don't have a lot of combat power, particularly if you're coming up against uh, any competent force, which the Ukrainians are. So he was surprised by the level of resistance. That's his second surprise. The third, third surprise for Putin is how quickly the world has kind of come behind Ukraine. I mean, Putin's mm. worldview was one that was probably shared by many others in different parts of the world that the West is weak, it's on the decline, American politics are seeing it on the decline um, and, you know, European defence spending, which is low, indicates it's on the decline um, Putin's probably been surprised by a rapid turnaround in Western political views on defence and defending democratic ideals. I mean, who would have imagined even three weeks ago the rearmament of Germany in the yeah. defence of dem democracy beyond its borders? And sending I mean, weapons to Ukraine. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, it takes a special kind of genius to pull that off. And, you know, Putin is that special kind and it's not the good kind. Well, it's the irony as well, because you've you've quoted uh, Vladimir Lenin uh, in your book, uh, who uh, allegedly said there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find the irony that it's another Vladimir uh, that it's uh, kind of proving that right. Because, uh, as you said, I mean, Germany's Ostpolitik has changed vastly. Switzerland uh, is, contrib is the third largest uh, contributor to the sanctions uh, mm -hmm. against um, Russia. I mean, this is if we want to look at a week that's 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 uh, uh, capturing decades. This is surely it, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Um, and you know, the the decades we're seeing play out each each day and, and week in this war are about a political reformation in Europe, as one observer described it. it we're now seeing the post post-Cold War Europe emerge. And I think there's there's a lot to that. Um, we're also seeing a Russia that may have to fundamentally change in the wake of this invasion, up to and including potentially um, a change of regime at the very top. I mean, I think uh, the fall of Ukraine and a regime change in Russia are almost uh, equally certain to emerge from this. Um, what happens first? Uh, you know, will be interesting. But I, I can't see how Putin can continue to rule Russia in the way that he has for the last 20 years in the mm. wake of what has been a personal disaster uh, driven by him solely. Um, and it has demonstrated terrible decision-making and really bad strategic ethics. Mm. So... Going forward from here, what do you see as the unfolding scenario? Because, I mean, we've talked about Ukraine resistance, Ukrainian resistance, and, of course, if anything, Putin's achieved completely the opposite of what he intended to, and that's the galvanising not only of NATO but Europe, as we just talked about. Mm. Um, we know that there's a, you know, thousands of uh, uh, anti-tank weapon systems are being provided to Ukrainians on a daily basis. There's potential of, of planes coming in. So there's a very fine line that NATO and Europe is walking from, well, officially declaring war on Russia. Mm. What, how do you see this unfolding? Because as you rightly pointed out, capturing and holding Ukraine is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a big ask. Is it even possible? Yeah, I, you know, I think the Russian army, people keep saying, oh, it's so big, it's much larger than Ukraine. Well, remember, it's only about 280,000. Know, the Russian army is smaller than the US army. 
And so what's the at, two million that we keep here? I mean, is that the reserve force? Is it? Uh, that, that's that, the reserve force. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and we all know that um, reserves take time to mobilise to prepare. Um, and the more quickly you mobilise them and throw them at the fight, the more likely they are to be unsuccessful and take higher casualties. So, you know, the Russians have committed almost all of the 200,000 with which they encircled Ukraine in the lead-up to the war. There's evidence that they are starting to bring in forces from garrisons further away, including the east. Um, there's a few strategic risks here now. It's, you know, the Russian army will be becoming combat fatigued as an advancing army into a country that hates them and that is resisting every step of the way and and as, as an army that suffers from a lack of purpose, to be quite frank, uh, they will be getting, uh, both individually and as an organisation, very fatigued, and that will start to bite over the coming days and weeks, I think. But with the Russians stripping out forces in other locations across Russia, um, it's showing off potentially uh, what a, a toothless tiger the Russian military has become less obviously, the thousands of nuclear weapons that they still deploy. Mm. And I guess you've also made the point in the book, and I think we've learned that lesson from Afghanistan, is that regardless of all the technological advances uh, that a military might possess, uh, it's ultimately the people that are using those and the people on the ground that will win the day. Uh, and I guess that's what we're seeing uh, again in uh, in Ukraine, and that's, that's certainly something that your book uh, addresses. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's the simple things that matter, um, mm. and those simple things come from humans. For example, both sides have equal access to the internet uh, and social media. One side has used it well, the other side has not. Mm. Um, you know, the Ukrainians have kept their communications network up and running. There's a great Monash Twitter feed that looks at it, and generally it's been between about 85 and 95% capacity, which is just well beyond what we might have expected this far into the war. I mean, the Russians were supposed to be masters at this stuff. Um, you know, I think you might call them now the gang that couldn't influence mm. straight. Um, and also the Ukrainians have focused on building an international coalition, which the Russians just haven't been able to do. None of those things have anything to do with technology. They're about people and they're about ideas. Mm. Yeah, and... You, you also talked about and, and published uh, in, a, in a recent article as well about that the Ukraine is likely to face um, some serious, uh, well, three in particular decisions that they'll need to make. Um, what are those decisions and how are you seeing them play out since you've um, published that piece of, about four days ago now, I think? Yeah, I think, you know, the most probably there's two really pressing ones. Uh, the first one is the forces, the Ukrainian forces in the east, uh, I think in the sh medium term, they're at risk of being encircled. Um, so the Ukrainians will need to make some big decisions, and this is high military command and political decisions about ceding ground so their army can survive. Mm. I mean, that's really important. Um, and the second one, and probably the biggest one, is the survival of the Ukrainian leadership. I mean, these, these two aspects, the Ukrainian president and his leadership, and the Ukrainian military must survive. And if that means that uh, they have to cede ground or even some of the smaller cities for that, um, their strategy will probably have to embrace that give and take and the ceding of ground and cities to ensure their leadership and their military survives to perpetrate this, uh, per um, perpetuate this mm. fight against the Russians. I guess they're trading space for time. Uh, and again, time is another uh, aspect that you've talked a lot about in the book. Who, on, on whose side is time at the moment? Uh, I would say the Ukrainians own the clocks now. You know, it's a saying that come out of a reputedly out of a Taliban leader um, in Afghanistan. We said, well, you you may have the watches, but we own the clocks. Um, I think that's pretty much the case. What we're seeing now, Putin does not have a lot of time here. Sanctions will take time to bite, but they will bite. Um, the Russian people have largely been kept in the dark, but they will start to see more of what's being done in their names. And the coffins will start flowing home in ever larger numbers, whether it's a conventional fight or an insurgency, that is impossible to hide. So both from an international perspective and a domestic perspective, Putin needs this over quickly. 
That just mm. isn't going to happen. So the Ukrainians have all the time um, and Putin is under a lot of pressure. Yeah, absolutely. And also, the uh, what do you make, I mean, as a general of any army, but as, uh, of, of the Australian army that's known as one that's quite capable and punching above its uh, above its weight. What do you make of the infamous Russian battalion tactical group, which we've uh, you know come to, well, maybe not fear, but certainly be apprehensive about, uh, given what we're seeing both operationally and tactically on the ground? Uh, and what are some of the lessons that certainly Western militaries are going to take away from this? Yeah, I mean, the battalion tactical group uh, is an interesting case study in evolved uh, organisations. Um, once again, a great hypothesis for what might work in war. What we're seeing play out is um, maybe it's not the right construction for this kind of war. Or the other side of it is maybe they're just not being led well. And I think there's sufficient evidence that, uh, firstly, the leadership has been poor. The uh, soldiers were not told what they were going to do. They sat around for a long time. I don't think they used their time building up very well, to be quite frank. Um, it, it, and forces have appeared to be committed piecemeal around linear road axes. Um, so maybe it's not the organisation of the battalion tactical groups that's the problem here, but how they've been committed and, more importantly, how they've been led. Mm. Yeah, and, and, of course, uh, they're exercising training uh, and, of course, logistics. I mean, it's a, w- w- what's the saying? Uh, uh, amateurs talk tactics, professional talk logistics. Uh, and I guess we're seeing that play out here. Were you surprised that at the insane logistical nightmares that uh, the Russian army is facing or has faced over the past 10 days? Hey, not particularly. I mean, you've been, you're in the army. Uh, I'm in the army. We've all seen logistics challenges on normal training exercises. And the reason those logistics challenges happen is not because, well, not always, <laughs> because of leadership incompetence. It's just logistics in military operations that are moving fast are really difficult. Every professional military organisation on the advance teaches its people to be aggressive in the advance. Our cavalry, our infantry, our armour, our attack aviation and the others that support them are taught to move fast um, and to be very aggressive uh, in the assault and in the advance. That means sometimes that even the very best military leaders run out of supplies. Mm. Mm. And uh, we saw that you know, that famously happened to Patton in the Second World War. <clears throat> mm. um, so that might that is some of the challenge here. But I also think, you know, if you have a look at the uh, a map of the Russian axes of advance here, there are multiples, and that just makes the challenge of supporting multiple axes um, really, really difficult from a logistic perspective. And if you have a look at the south, Um, They're on diverging axes, which Mm. makes those challenges even more profound. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I guess the 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 leadership piece that you just alluded to uh, really undercuts uh, any or 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 really contributes to any of those deficiencies and uh, makes them really prominent. Uh, And I guess we're seeing the opposite again. A case study uh, for the ages is certainly going to be the leadership example of Zelensky versus Putin, uh, and the famous pictures of. Uh, Zelensky in the trenches sipping tea with his kind of general staff and, and, and soldiers while Putin is uh, sitting on a you know 50 foot table uh, with his uh, with his general staff. What do you think China is making of all of this? Uh, and undoubtedly China will be watching uh, how this is playing out. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons here for dictators and how they make decisions in the first instance. I mean, Um, Old blokes um, leading countries that don't have any say in selecting their leadership uh, tend to become more isolated, uh, more protective of their position and more paranoid um, as time goes on. We've seen that from Putin, definitely. Mm. I mean, the 20-foot tables is just one manifestation of that. I mean, he hasn't had any significant close human contact for nearly two years because of COVID. Um, President Xi in China is not that different from that. You know, he's he's almost isolated himself since COVID. He's purged a lot of um, leadership aspirants uh, from both the PLA and the uh, Chinese Communist Party more broadly, which means 
um, he's not going to get the broad diversity of views that he sh- he probably should get as a national leader across all the aspects of governing, from national security to the economy and, and society. Um, that is the strategic advantage of democracies in the 21st century. We may move slow at times, but we do consider lots of different ideas. Um, and that is an enormous, enormous strength of democracies. Uh, that's clearly what the Ukrainian people um, see as their future, and that's why they're fighting so hard. Mm. And a lot's been made in the recent past, certainly uh, during the Olympics as well, of the um, enduring relationship between Russia and China, um, you know, the, a, a, a relationship that has no boundaries. Do you think that's slowly changing now? At least we're seeing there was the two major uh, Chinese banks have uh, issued sanctions against uh, against Russia. Uh, China has sought to be balanced in their approach. They certainly haven't uh, criticised Putin publicly, but they've also abstained from voting in the UN. Mm. Uh, they were one of the 35 countries that abstained, but certainly weren't one of the five that uh, wo- voted against the UN resolution, which basically declare to the, wo- to the world that this is an illegal invasion. So what do you think China will make of this going forward, given the ongoing competition and contestation with uh, US? Well, I think uh, it will look at the West anew. Um, in essence, over the last two weeks, China has lost Europe. Uh, Europe will probably never again be as fawning over China as it has been up until now. Uh, That doesn't mean there aren't still important economic relationships there. There are. Our own country has them. Uh, But I think Europe and the US will look very differently at some of the authoritarian regimes around the world and how they operate both domestically and internationally. Mm. I think the PLA have a lot to learn here. I mean, the Russian army is a deeply experienced combined arms organisation um, with theories that are based on operational practice um, as well as their doctrines and, and a good training regime, although in this instance it hasn't been good enough. The PLA will look at that and go, uh, well, if an experienced, well-equipped uh, army can fail like this, this beautiful shining toy that we've created over the last 20 years may not be as capable as we thought it was. And finally, they will look at that 180 kilometres that separates Taiwan from China very, very differently. If um, Ukraine, which had no no, uh, significant obstacles at the border, can be difficult, just getting across the Taiwan Strait will be a hugely difficult operational challenge for the Chinese. And frankly, I think it's probably beyond them. Yeah. Okay. That, that's a, and I guess that's reassuring to hear because that um, hopefully might stifle this uh, at least the narrative that the war between China, US, and of course us by extension uh, is almost inevitable, which is what we're hearing um, quite a lot. What are your thoughts though going forward? Is is this conflict between China and the US as the two great powers of the world at the moment? Is it inevitable? Well, competition is. Um, well, maybe that's a good way. That's probably something I should have asked you uh, if I have highlighted as a question. What do you mean when you talk about great power dynamics as ranging between cooperation, competition and conflict? To some listeners, it might not be as obvious because there are, there are some shades of grey in there. Yeah, well, um, clearly large nations have an interest in a degree of cooperation, whether it's about how the international trade system works um, deconflicting a range of different um, uh, areas of military capability, or even just collaborating on uh, on societal issues, whether it comes to uh, immigration uh, and these kind of things, or some of the big challenges like climate change. There's, there is and should be a degree of cooperation there. Um, yeah, competition gets to trade. It gets to a battle of ideas. Obviously, the US and China have very different ideas about how countries should be led and how societies should work. Um, But conflict or or warfare, either it's fighting each other or through proxies, is is likely. 
um, as we've seen in the past, all the way back to the great competitions between powers uh, historically. But it's, I don't think it's inevitable. Um, and that's why uh, cooperation and healthy competition are an important part of uh, putting off conflict in the future between these two powers. Yeah. One other aspect of the of the kind of Russia China piece that on, on the kind of macro geopolitical level is that both of those countries have used some of our own recent wars, whether it be in Afghanistan or Iraq or even the bombing of uh, Serbia. They've used that as examples of our own hypocrisy. Why are our wars different to their wars? It's an interesting question and, uh, you know, there is a fair bit of self-flagellation from certain commentators in the West about, you know... The what about isms uh, Yeah, but, what about yeah. isms yeah. or this, it's all our fault and, and this kind of stuff. Um, you know, that's an important part of the debate to test our own ideas about ourselves and in a democracy we do absolutely need those kind of voices. That doesn't mean I agree with them and, and largely I don't. Um, but they are important voices and they're the kind of voices that you will never, ever hear in Russia, China, North Korea, Iran and places like that. So they're important to have as part of the debate. I don't always agree with them. I don't, you know, agree with this notion that oh, it's the West fault that Russia invaded Ukraine because they might become part of NATO. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that democracies wouldn't support um, other nations that want to become democracies, regardless of where they are. I mean, how close to China is Japan? It's very close. That doesn't mean it should automatically fall within a Chinese sphere of influence. And it's the same thing with Ukraine. Uh, the democratic nations of the world su should support the growth of democracy wherever it is to be found. Mm. I guess the point I was uh, hoping to get at as well is that, you know, and and to talk about Clausewitz, who you refer to throughout the book quite a lot, that undoubtedly war is an extension of politics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're talking about Russian sphere of influence or Chinese sphere of influence, it's very easy for those nations to talk about Western spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Putin's said it a thousand times that you can't increase the security of one nation by decreasing it, uh, the security of another, of course, referring to Ukraine not uh, shouldn't be allowed to go to NATO. I guess at some point we have to 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 allow for an off ramp or to 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 refrain from going into conflict, which will ultimately make it inevitable. Uh, is find a middle ground somewhere, and I just can't see how we do that without at least acknowledging the genuine at times concerns that some of these nations might have against our own, rather than becoming galvanized more in our own identity and embracing our own uh, positions. But ultimately, it, it ultimately, I fear, makes war inevitable. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, war is always inevitable when humans have different ideas and different aspirations, um, particularly when those ideas and aspirations on one side are uh, about the suppression of people and not allowing them to fully achieve their full potential. I mean, I just can't see how the 21st century won't be a grand competition between um, the values of democratic freedom and uh, full prosperity of people on one side. Not perfect, we know that, but um, certainly better than denying people freedom of expression and the capacity to fully realise the ultimate potential that we're seeing in these authoritarian regimes. I mean, I, I think it's a fantasy to think there won't be further conflict between those ideas um, and I think the 21st century may well see us um, seek to finalise this question of democracy versus dictatorships. Is that your assessment of the 21st century, that that's the, that, that that's the uh, ideological battle going forward? I think, I think that's what we're seeing now, um, and I think we're going to see that more. I mean, certainly that's the narrative that China's had out there over the last decade or more about the decline of the US. I mean, for them, the decline of the US is a metaphor for the decline of the democratic systems. And, you know, we've seen Freedom House's assessments of world democracies over the last three years in particular. 
um, describe a decline in the number of democracies and the quality of democracies around the world. Mm. So there is some foundation for that narrative. It doesn't mean it's inevitable and it doesn't mean we should accept it. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And, and I, I mean, we're the superpower of the, of the world, US, is a nation that's, uh, what, 50% of its uh, voting population believes the last election was stolen. Mm. Uh, that in itself is a, is a huge uh, issue on, uh, I guess, a question of US uh, understanding of democracy and its own values. How do you see that, given that you've just recently returned as well from the US for your book launch, what is your feel of the US at the moment uh, and how is the current war in Ukraine, what is its impact? Is it becoming part of a solution or is it contributing to the problem of, of kind of polarisation we're seeing in the US? Um, I think it's been interesting. You've seen a more unified um, polity in the United States over the last week. I wouldn't say fully unified because it never is, and it's a democracy. There's a competition of ideas, and that's one of the things that, that makes it great, right? Um, but for all its weaknesses, it has a huge number of strengths. Um, you know, this idea of freedom and liberty are powerful ideas for human beings. The US, as the last few weeks have shown, remains a economically and militarily powerful nation. You know, economically and military, it is still the preeminent power in the world today. And to be quite frank, when you have a look at all the other options, I wouldn't want it any other way. Well, I guess that's a, <laughs> that, that's it in a nutshell, right? But, and, and I guess that's uh, that's what's forcing the the big division in the world as well, is uh, people are, uh, are conscious that the US sphere of influence, call it whatever you want, uh, is still certainly... Uh, for most Western nations, preferred to a Chinese uh, uh, sphere of influence. Mm. Maybe we can pivot just uh, very briefly, and, and I know we're coming close to the end of our time, but uh, towards lessons learned from this, uh, given that your book is written, uh, of course, for a broad audience, but you, you do make the point that it's for current and future leaders uh, of Western um, militaries, democratic militaries. What are some of the lessons that you'd like military leaders to take away from what we're seeing play out? I think there's a few things here. I think we're seeing that um, the balance of information and violence needs to be constantly honed and thought about. Um, we have seen the Ukrainians do a masterful job in both the, the strategic narrative but also protecting their own information. Um, the second one is the um, integration of air and land. I mean, the Russians have been awful at it. I mean, how an air force the size of Russia has not been able to achieve air superiority over Ukraine uh, is just beyond me. I mean, what do you put it down to? I mean, that's a really important question. Uh, it's been a couple of really good um uh, pieces in Rusi about that. So I won't get into it in detail, but I think there's a lot of reasons and, and the Russian Air Force in general has is not the capable Air Force or the quality Air Force that a lot of people have assumed it to be. Uh, a third observation is we still need fast-moving, combined, highly lethal uh, conventional forces on the ground because at the end of the day, on the ground is where the people are and in particular People are in the cities. You cannot win wars with navies and air force. They just can't. You can win battles, but wars are won on the ground where the people are, and you need very capable ground forces to do that. Now, they might like look slightly different to what we see now. They may have a different balance of long-range firepower, armour, um, infantry engineers, communications and logistics and what we see now, but they're a central part of military power in the 21st century. The final observation is strategy matters. Strategic mm. thinking matters. I wrote a piece on this and published it last year about the importance of strategic thinking. Um, Russian strategy in this campaign has been delusional. And from their poor assumptions about a rapid collapse of Ukraine and a declining West has come every single operational and tactical era of the Russian forces. So we should be reinvesting in our capacity to think through strategic challenges and come up with really good strategies for the 21st century for our country. Hmm. And you've just published a piece this morning in the ABC as well about the war moving into the cities. What do you see happening over the next week, 10 days in Ukraine? 
Uh, certainly we're seeing a move into the cities. I think my thread yesterday talked about how the Russians might seek to en- envelop it. I'll so- shortly publish something about how they might g- look at their city operations. Um, so we're going to see that. That is going to be a long, drawn-out fight because both Russia and Ukraine now have made Kiev a significant political objective, not a military objective, but a significant political objective. Why is that important? Why is, why is the city as a political objective important? Well, firstly, it's Ukraine. It's a symbol for Ukraine that they retain sovereignty and that they retain control of their country. It is where their president is located and from which he is uniting his people and also uniting international opinion. Uh, for the Russians, they equate the fall of Kiev to the fall of Ukraine. That is not true, but there is some truth to it. So Kiev is a central element in the Russian campaign. It must be a central component of Ukrainian strategy, and they will fight bitterly over a long period of time to retain control of that city. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, just thinking back to Sarajevo, I I was in Germany at the time, but uh, Sarajevo was on its knees. Uh, It was fully surrounded and it was about to fall. Uh, And there were messages coming in from other cities uh, in Bosnia uh, to the city of Sarajevo from the citizens saying, if you fall, we'll fall with you, um, which is basically what gave the city of Sarajevo a renewed spirit of, hey, we are the symbolic centre of this nation. Uh, and, you know, if we live, the nation lives. Uh, and I think that's certainly what we're seeing play out uh, in the Ukraine as well. My last question to you, uh, General, is uh, if you could rewrite your book today, are there any points you'd reassess or, or emphasise more greatly uh, and 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 perhaps even more importantly, some that you would like to uh, shape and morph, given what we've uh, seen over the past ten days. Um, I, I, there would be only one, uh, and there's a lot on this in the book. But I'd emphasise it even more strongly: is the moral forces in war, uh, the centrality of good purpose um, for civilians and soldiers in a war. Um, the Ukrainians have that in this war. The Russian soldiers clearly. Do not, and neither does the Russian people. And the second part of that is good leadership matters. I mean, it is so important. Um, And in an era where we uh, emphasise, particularly in our organisation, a more collaborative style of leadership, you need those individuals who will stand up, make the hard decisions and lead and unify their people. We need to build those people. Um, And we need to understand that those people must be risk takers, they must be entrepreneurs, and they must be the kind of people that can make decisions under the worst of circumstances without having to throw everything back at a committee. Wonderfully said, General, and particularly the moral piece. I mean, that is one of the pillars of the uh, fighting force, certainly of the Australian Army, right? Intellectual, physical and moral. Uh, General, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for uh, making the time, firstly, to uh, speak with me uh, and then, of course, giving me so much of it. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks, mate. It's uh, been really great to talk to you this morning and I I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Voices of War. And since you got this far, please consider showing your support by liking and reviewing the show wherever you catch your pods. Also, if you're able, please consider showing your support through our Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee page. Links to both are in the show notes. Thank you, and until next time.